Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Mulligan. I'm the Head of Online Learning and Innovation in the Institute of Technology Sligo in the west of Ireland. We're soon to become the Atlantic Technological University with two other similar sized institutions here. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is improving access to engineering education. This is a presentation that I'll be making tomorrow to the Indian Society for Tech technical education Kerala region so I'd like to have a recording just um, in case anything goes technically wrong and maybe to make it available to a wider audience okay so first of all I'd like to say that this is the way we tend to look at the purpose of technology and education in higher education it can be used to improve the quality of the learning experience it can be used to improve access by students who can't get to campus courses, um, or it can be used to reduce the cost. Now, I have to say that I would be disappointed generally in higher education in the sense that I feel that they focus much of their effort on, uh, on quality as opposed to access and cost. To be fair, a lot of work has gone on in improving access through the use of technology, but very little has been done to reduce the cost of education. A lot of online courses now would be available at the same fee level or the same cost as campus courses. So not a lot has been done to reduce cost. Now, I, just, I thought that this might just be a trouble with universities maybe in Europe and the USA where I would read a lot about. But in actual fact, last week I came across this article by Sarin and Mandel, and they were making this point for universities in India that they need to be careful about going online, becoming digital, and how it would impact the quality. Now, I have to say that I don't agree with them. I think you need to get online and get online quickly and improve access. There is a slight risk that it might impact on quality. I don't believe it's significant, but I believe it's important that we act and that we go online. Now, having shown this where the emphasis is, this is the way I think the emphasis should be. And the reason for that is that where I would put cost even ahead of access is because to some extent, I feel that the access pr problem has been solved. Um, we don't necessarily need to the, the internet there. I know some people don't have good access to the internet, from, but from a technological point of view and a pedagogical point of view, we have solved that problem uh, from delivery. Um, but the courses that we are, are selling online are just as expensive as the ones we have in campus and we need to work on cost. Now, a lot of people, universities, when they ask to make changes, they just look for grants and the, the idea is that we should invest a lot of money on it. And I have to say that I don't agree with that as well. In fact, I would suggest that if you, if you enable change by investing a lot of money through special grants, to some extent, the solutions that come out of that are not sustainable. They need a lot of money actually to maintain them. So we need actually solutions that are actually cheap to create as well. So I would say these are certain things that I would believe that we should be emphasizing. Simplicity, uh, we need to get scale to get cost down. Simplicity to, to reduce the cost of production. So we really need to be looking at new models of learning rather than just digitizing the existing models. Now, this is a sort of an illustration of a course I did recently on um, uh, Coursera. Uh, I did five courses on Coursera, part of a specialization, and they were actually, I think they really il illustrated the power of simplicity. All they were were short videos each week. There would be five or six videos. There would be quiz questions between each video. And at the end of the week, there would be a progression quiz to um, uh, for going on online to the next week. Now, if you, there was probably about 40 to 60 minutes of content, uh, maybe not even that. And uh, if you were having problems, there was a question and answer form that was always available there and other students, other people taking the learners, taking the course could answer your questions or maybe you might be lucky and you might get a teaching assistant from the university to come in and help as well. And this would go on over so many weeks. I think it was typically about five, six weeks, uh, each week being more or less identical in structure and eventually um, uh, you'll get to the end of the last week, at which case they would give you 
an assignment, uh, uh, like an essay to write, okay? And that would be graded by other people on the course, okay? Uh, and if the grades were high enough if the, that you got, uh, you would get an automatic certificate. And there's a little photograph up there with this certificate I got. It was very satisfactory, I have to say. But in actual fact, uh, from what I've been reading about these books, simple and all as they are, those videos were very polished and uh, very expensive to make. I believe the typical MOOC uh, cost between thirty and $50,000 to make, which is a lot of funds for an ordinary college to have, and they can't make many MOOCs. I believe that this doesn't have to be like this, and my inspiration probably goes back farther than these uh, MOOCs to Salman Khan, who had been putting up videos on YouTube for free, very simply made, very cheaply made, and very effective, and very powerful. And, <coughs> and Salman then built that into the Khan Academy, uh, where he had lots of these simple videos that millions of people use around the world. Now, what this illustrates is that you, using a simple technique, you can produce the materials, the study materials, extremely cheaply. So probably from, from some work that we have done in live online teaching and what the likes of Sal McCann has done in uh, putting up recordings on YouTube, there are some principles that occurred to me uh, to be important principles and valuable principles. Uh, and once, to be honest with you, I was practicing a lot of these and not realizing what they were. Now, the first one was keep it simple. Uh, I did notice that we didn't have much funds to do much. We took simple approaches uh, to our online learning, uh, whereas other, other colleges seem to be doing it extremely complicated. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the principle of keeping it simple is very important. Now, this is one that I probably would have practiced, but didn't realize that this was a, a well-known principle, which is that doing the right thing is more important than doing things right. I constantly hear in higher education, uh, people talking about excellence, and, uh, but remember perfection is the enemy of the good. You will have for, far more impact if you look around and figure out what's the right thing to do and do it rather than just doing some things to levels of excellence if they're not going to have an impact. So doing the right thing, even to a relatively mediocre level of competence or quality, is better than doing something that's not of value if you do it excellently. So, it's a, so I would say, to me, access to education is we need to do it now. We just do it. It's the right thing to do. Uh, also, the idea of the Pareto principle is things can get very expensive very quickly. If you do it simple, maybe using 20% of the effort and resources, you can probably achieve 80% of what you could achieve if you took an expensive high effort route. The, it's also known as the law of diminishing returns. And the other thing is, uh, this concept of Agile has come to the fore, particularly in software, but it's beginning to make its way into other areas as well, is that if you're going to develop something, try not to make a big project out of it. Find out what your minimum viable product, what can you do just to get it up and get started. Get it out to the public, get it even to a small number of users and get feedback from them and continuously improve. Often you find that you've done quite a good job, like you've done your You've done the 80% job and it requires very little modification, uh, very little continuous improvement. There's always room for improvement, but you can get it out to very large numbers very quickly. Don't cross bridges before you come to them. You know, don't solve problems that you're not sure you have. Just do it. Then you'll find out if there's any problems and you can fix them. So this is the concept of agile development. These principles I found to be very useful. Now, I could say this is maybe a type of a simplistic case study that uh, that might illustrate some of these principles. It's uh, some principles that I think are important in the digitizing of continuing education that I've been working on, continuing edu engineering education for the last 20 years or so. Okay, so in the 90s, when I was trying to get into this, uh, I, I tried to get into computer-based training. You had these expensive multi interactive multimedia systems. They were very expensive, took a huge amount of work. 
Uh, I didn't have the money or the time to get into it. I found out later, actually, to be honest with you, they didn't have that great an impact. They were expensive and they were quite dull. Uh, they weren't really that pedagogical effective. Uh, effective. In 2002, we started our online distance learning for the first time with five students in a degree, a top-up degree for people who already had qualifications in manufacturing quality management. We only had five students, but it was live classes online, a very simple approach. Uh, it, during 2000 to 2010, roughly, uh, YouTube was really beginning to catch on. Anybody could put up videos. It turned out like a lot of these videos were very good. And that's when the Khan Academy emerged, or, or Salman Khan emerged. This user-generated content. So what we learned during the noughties was that simple content could be very effective. People started careers through putting up their own material on YouTube. In 2012, the year of the MOOC. Now, this was more or less edX and Coursera. Uh, free online but no accreditation but extremely simple and it just showed us what we could do at scale um, I would say those courses were a little bit expensively produced uh, but they were simple and they got out to a lot of people now 2020 that online learning that we started in our institution in 2002 we reached four and a half thousand learners which was pretty good given that our campus had about three and a half thousand learners so we were pushing an open door, as they say. There was just huge demand out there as fast as we could simply develop live online versions of our evening classes, we could get students. It was an extremely successful model. Of course, now with COVID, everybody started teaching in this live online. So you could say, no, everybody's going to be doing it. It's going to be huge. There's no way back. Now, I have to say, I've heard some stories recently that a lot of people are just quite keen to go back to the way they were before and don't really want to take on a lot of the lessons we learned. One of the things we did here, students, each students, campus students, want these online recordings. So there are some lessons there. Now, I have to say this is that this is just really digitization. We just took our evening classes and put them live online. That was just digitization or we record. That really wasn't a change. Or we're still doing degrees, we're still doing courses and modules, we're still doing classes. Uh, there wasn't really any uh, radical change there. That was digitization of what we did already. We were just putting it online. If we were to think about digital transformation, the concept of digital transformation, let's look at it like this. On a traditional, we have classes, practical in, in labs, those types of things. We give the students assignments. Uh, they take exams. Um, uh, we digitize those. What's digitizing? We have live online classes or we give recordings, as I just said. In terms of the labs and that, we could substitute simulations uh, and other things. Um, uh, we get them to submit electronically. It's more convenient, but it's hardly revolutionary. And they do online exams, quizzes and exams. A bit quicker for us to grade, but essentially not a lot different. A digital transformation, on the other hand, might be, well, why why not have them at low cost and huge, like 2,000, 4,000 students in the class in one go, or maybe even a million students in the class in one go? How would we handle that? Well, maybe we use AI and we have adaptive learning. And adaptive is very important technology where it um, it's watching the performance of the student and it's changing what it sends to the students or controlling its, the student's progress depending on the performance and what it's learned from, from other students in the past. Why do we have degrees at all? We might have chunk it up in smaller and have micro-credentials so people can present all these micro-credentials to employers, maybe not a degree at all. Uh, do we just ask people to pass exams or do we ask them to demonstrate that they're competent at something? We give them a load of materials, off you go and study, come back when you think you're competent uh, and we'll test you. Uh, could we have them in the workplace and deliberately giving them experiences in the workplace that uh, that they learn from and test them on that? Or could we, if they insist on to come to college, do we need classes at all? They can learn a lot of stuff online. Should we be having them on projects so that they're preparing for the workplace? These are what would be, I suppose, you could consider to be new models. New models that we can only do now because we have learning technology. We couldn't do in the past because we didn't have learning technologies. 
if we were to look at the landscape of all the new ideas that have been coming out over the years. Now, this slide will get a bit messy, so we just run through it quickly, just to show you that all the things that are happening, you have the MOOCs, of course, the massive open online courses. Uh, here's a free university. You just pay for your examination. LinkedIn Learning has been used for people in the workplace. You just get these small courses and you get these little certificates. Maybe that's more valuable than doing a degree. Unbundling of a higher education, the concept that about some people produce the materials, some people define the courses, uh, the learning happens on the student's own and maybe they come back and do assessment. And all different people do different things in higher education. Uh, the micromasters idea, in other words, we don't go for full programs, we go for shorter programs, but have good college accreditation. Georgia Tech's uh, low cost online degree in computer science. I think that's quite revolutionary. And to me, that's the model that we need all to be looking at. $7,000 sounds like a lot, but compared to what it costs to typically to do a master's in the United States and the fact that you can do this while you're working, that is really dirt cheap by US standards. Uh, credentials other than degrees, alternative credentials, a big movement in that, issuing them digitally so that people can have lots of small credentials and they can be easily evaluated by an employer or another uh, teaching organization, maybe using blockchain to do that. Self-directed learning for the students, we don't stand over them all the time. We just say, off you go, learn that, come back when you're ready to be assessed. The flipped classroom, they, we don't teach them stuff. We get them to watch, or directly in class, we get them to go watch videos, do things, take quizzes so that we know they've done it before class, they come to class, and then we have discussions. We apply the learning that they should have already had before coming to class. Or peer learning where students teach each other, and we put them into, uh, what would you say, you, you could almost say project-based learning, a bit like that, you know, put them in groups and get them to teach each other. By all accounts, are very effective. Uh, Free-range learning, which I sort of feel is a, a form of self-directed learning, but perhaps the students even choose what to learn and come back later to the accreditation, accrediting body and say, look at all I've learned here. Does that make me an engineer type of thing, you know? Recognition of prior learning where the colleges give credits for learning that students may have picked up in all sorts of ways. Uh, I mentioned the European MOOC Consortium because that's a group of universities in Europe that are willing to accept uh, learning from MOOCs taken from other colleges, which is in a way, it sounds obvious, but it's only recently been able to gain traction. Uh, degree apprenticeships, in other words, you're doing sort of on the job, very controlled work while you're working to get your degree and more learning on the job. And that is a form uh, more gen of, of work-based learning, more generic work-based learning, where students spend more time on the job and learn there. Also learning their theory as well, of course. Uh, the use of simulations rather than access to labs that can help bring down costs significantly. Uh, by the way, research seems to indicate that spending uh, half, uh, reducing the time in actual labs and spending more time in simulation actually yields better outputs than all the time in a lab because there's a limit to what we can allow students to do in a lab, but often with the simulation, we can allow them to do a lot more real uh, experimentation. This That slide there has come up there, the one that I just said, um, that's uh, uh, a remote access to an actual physical lab that we have in Sligo where they're programming, I think they're using ladder logic to program that device. So we can have remote labs as well have them working on projects through college rather than sitting in classes. And remember, they can learn on their own what they need for the projects. And of course, there is adaptive learning where uh, I've mentioned this already, where the system that the content is contained in is able to respond to the individual needs, to adapt to the individual needs of a particular learner. So all those things are coming out. So the next thing I want us to do is let's imagine a low cost engineering degree. Could we build such a degree? And this is just maybe one idea in it. Okay, so we have the knowledge and theory. Uh, that's mechanics, thermodynamics, mathematics, electrical principles, all those things that we know have to do in an engineering degree. A lot of this can be done with online self-study. Okay, and we can test them with just low cost uh, multiple choice tests, tests where they have to type in numbers, things like that. A lot of the testing to see, do they understand? Can they apply uh, 
particularly the quantitative principles, the quantitative ideas, doing the calculations. Can they do these calculations? And we can, uh, can they remember the properties of materials? Those types of things, we can do that very cheaply online. Of course, with engineering and a lot of tech, technology subjects, there's practice and application that we have to work as well. Uh, so maybe we can put them working on projects. Um, I mean, I would believe, I, I would suggest that a lot of um, what we do in labs maybe doesn't have the impact because the students don't have a lot of control in the labs. Whereas working on projects, they might actually learn a lot more about what they need for the, for the workplace. And to be honest with you, if they were in the workplace, we placed them in the workplace, supervised by people in the workplace, that would help reduce the cost. It would help the students earn money, remember? This would reduce the cost significantly and they would learn a lot. And maybe they don't need to be in labs so much if they're seeing a lot of uh, the application of engineering principles in their workplace, in a suitable workplace. Now, uh, there still is probably more expense involved in the practice and application because uh, people may need tutors or mentors for that. They may need it for the self-study as well. But rather than that being available for everybody, it's only available if you need it. So that could reduce the cost significantly. Um, how do we assess uh, the practice and application? Well, they do reports, presentations, interviews, the mentors will give reports. That is probably more expensive than the computerized objective testing, but we can still take a lot of the cost out of it. A, a very useful idea is peer grading. Peer grading is very useful for students. When students go into groups of four or five and grade each other, um, it's a good experience for them to grade other students. It helps with their learning and also brings down the cost and the workload involved in grading students. And by the way, you imagine that the students will cheat, but some of the software available now has great tricks uh, embedded, it in it, embedded in those tools to uh, uh, stop cheating. Uh, again, we do have issues with who supervises them in the project. Is it their own work? The identity of the person that's done the work who supervised it can be verified. So we have some issues there and we won't get the cost to zero, let's say. Okay, so I'm going to give three examples now of projects that that I think maybe illustrate this idea. Uh, one of them is one that we've already completed in Sligo, which is a work-based degree in mechatronic systems engineering, where they'll spend four years in the workplace and three days, they'll be working for three days a week and studying for two days. They don't have to travel to the college so it doesn't disrupt the employer has them for three days a week and can make good use of them. Employers really like that, but they have the time for studying. Uh, this is, of course, more affordable because they're earning an income and maybe they're able to live at home if the workplace is near where they live. And at the moment, we have people all over Ireland and we hope to have people internationally working near where they live and on this program. Uh, but this is the most important thing is that this will give better performance. Uh, they'll do better. They'll perform better in the workplace because they see the application of what they're learning in their course and they will perform better in their studies because they see the relevance of it. Now this will reduce the cost, the, the middle band there because they can earn an income. We can also, because it's online teaching, we can deliver this to larger class sizes probably. Uh, so this is really does make an impact on costs. The second one here from Charles Sturt University a uh, project-based degree in civil engineering. Um, they come, this is an interesting idea now, but it doesn't reduce costs, to be honest with you, but I think it could. Uh, they come to the campus for one and a half years. They do on-campus projects, progressively reducing support. They don't have any classes at all. They use an adaptive system that brings them through the online theory and knowledge content, and they build a certain capacity for self-directed learning. Uh, then they go to the workplace before years, uh, studying online for one day, working for four days. After two of those years, they get a bachelor's thesis. Four years, they get a master's thesis. Now, this last one is one that I'm hoping to launch in the next while. And I, if anyone's interested, they should contact me. It's an open associates degree or a two-year program in engineering. It's going to be in electronics, embedded systems and mechatronics. And one of the reasons for that is that we feel a lot of the work in electronics, software and mechanical devices can be done on small, cheap devices, uh, little robots, 
little Arduinos, these types of things, and it will be a cheap uh, um, hardware-based uh, program for people who can't afford to go to college. And the pedagogical approach would be that there's lots of free content. They study it on their own. Uh, they may have to purchase kits or do certain simulations for practical work and they get small credentials and they stack these up and they would be assessed on a competency base. Can they do it? Do they know the knowledge? Uh, can they build something? Um, but it's open free content so that there would be assessment there. So they would, ha they would have to pay for that assessment uh, and for the accreditation. But hopefully that assessment would be efficient and that, uh, efficient and that would be relatively reasonably priced. In terms of the modes of learning, any student anywhere in the world should be able to sign up to this, uh, buy whatever kits online that they need for their practical, so an independent learner. But we think it would be also suitable for organizations that want to help young people locally get an education to form outreach centers, bring them into those and maybe have a maker space or fab lab where they can do the practical work. Now remember, some people are opposed to change. And this is one thing I feel it's rather harsh, but we should always realize this. Education doesn't exist for our sake. It doesn't exist for the sake of educators. But as engineers, I think we can't, we've never really been afraid of being redundant. In, in, in my life, I, I went to secondary school and college in the 1970s. I went from a slide rule to a cheap calculator. I used punch cards, writing computer programs. Uh, then the 1980s came, I thought it was going to be absolutely groundbreaking with the, the personal computer and, and indeed we were able to do great things on personal computers, but none of it was like the internet. The internet has made all the change and we should, as engineers and tech, technical people, we should be willing to embrace the technology even if it means we're less relevant as teachers because there'll be always something for us to do. No, so here's three questions I could pose. Um, do we need students to attend campus? Do we need classes? Do we need degrees? Those are the sort of questions that we need to ask to question are we really being radical in innovation? Okay, so I'm just going to finish off now with a summary slide here just to remind you of what I've been talking about is uh, it's really we're talking about digital transformation, not just digitizing the things that we've done in the past. We need new models if we want to improve access to education and avoid perfection, okay? Uh, if we do the right thing and do it now, even if we don't make a super job of it, this is a better way to go. Let's get stuck in and, and make changes. Access is the most important challenge, I, be, I believe. Um, there's a huge number of people who can't access go to higher education and cost is an access issue. So we need to get the cost down. I'd say in terms of cost of production, we need to keep it simple. I also mentioned that we need to go to scale to keep the unit cost down. And we can do that, go to scale and make much of it self-directed. The students can manage on their own to a large extent. We can add support if they need. Also in technical education, engineering education, we need to think about authentic learning as well to improve learning. I think that's the way to improve it if we want to uh, improve quality. And I would say work-based is a way that reduces the cost for the students. And if they're on campus, I think we should be doing project-based. Assessment is the key. To, if we're worried about standards, assessment is the key. We need to work on improving our, uh, improving our assessment uh, keeping the cost down on that assessment, that's the way we will maintain standards. It's not necessarily the teaching methods. So thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with me, please do.